its quest to provide an open forum for discussion of controversial issues. This station allows hosts and their guests to express themselves without any significant censorship. You're advised that any views expressed by the hosts or their guests are not necessarily the views of Tuggy Entertainment or its partners. It's time for the LinkedIn Lady Show. The LinkedIn Lady Show with Carol McManus is designed to inform, inspire, and educate businesses, entrepreneurs, and individuals on the effective use of social media for growing your business. Every social media site has a specific demographic, personality, and purpose. And that's what we'll learn about today. The LinkedIn Lady will interview a variety of guests business owners who will showcase their business and talk about how they're using social media to stay in touch with customers and to attract new relationships. She'll also have other guests who will be experts in social media who will speak to the use of Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Google and Plaxo and Squidoo and, of course, LinkedIn. And as trends change and new applications become available, you'll hear it first here. The LinkedIn Lady Show. And now, here's your host, Carol McManus. Hey everyone, it's Carol McManus, the LinkedIn lady, and I'm so happy to be with you today. I am actually on the West Coast broadcasting live from Seattle, and it is a typical Seattle day, about mid-40s. Uh, it's been raining off and on all day, but we don't let the weather bother us because we have much more important things to um, to chat about. And as always, we're going to talk about social media today. Uh, there's been some interesting uh, developments going on in the social media world uh, this last week. Uh, again, uh, the competition and the and the sort of the battle between Google Plus and Facebook is definitely heating up because more and more people, particularly in the business world, are moving over and adopting Google and starting to find some very creative ways. And you're going to hear more about that. I have a guest coming up next week who's going to talk about that in depth. But for today. Today, we are going to have a different show. I have a very, very special guest. And, uh, and again, I want to really put a shout out to business people who are listening, uh, especially those who have uh, receivables and who uh, are looking for lines of credit who really have had frustrations in this current market because they're, uh, they're at a point where of frustration where they can't uh, get the relationship response from the banks that perhaps they've had in the past. And, and that's a little bit of a teaser. I'm going to let Chris tell you more about that and how it works. But that's my guest. But more importantly, my guest today is a ninja when it comes to LinkedIn. And he's done some really creative and very effective things. I think he has one or two good stories to share with you about how LinkedIn has worked for him. So we will definitely have that LinkedIn uh, component. So let me tell you about our guest because I want to bring him right in as soon as possible. Chris Lanus is a 20-year veteran of the small business lending instant industry. Excuse me. He has held positions in commercial loan documentation, credit analysis, operations management, and business development at one of the country's largest small business lenders. Currently, Chris is the business development officer at Versant Funding, where he provides non-recourse factoring to businesses in a wide variety of industries, which cannot qualify for the financing they need from traditional lending sources. So again, if that's your category, Chris may or may not personally be the right person for you, but he's going to give you some good tips on how the industry works and what you may want to do uh, to be able to move your company forward from wherever you are right now. So Chris, let's bring him into the call. Are you ready to talk to the LinkedIn lady. I am here, Carol. Thanks for having me. Hey, delighted to have you. So I have to ask, because I left New York at a very, very early more, uh, hour this morning. What's it like in New York today? You know, not bad for January. It's uh, Where I am, it's in the, uh, the upper 40s, low 50s, so can't complain. I was going to say that's pretty decent. That 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 qualifies oh, yeah. as a, as a January thaw. Absolutely. So, um, okay. so Chris, is there anything else you want to add? I gave you you know a little bit of an introduction. Is there anything you'd like to add about your background and maybe maybe from the perspective of how did you get into this crazy business? Sure. No, I'd be happy to uh, give you a little bit of uh, additional background. As you mentioned in the introduction, uh, pretty much my whole career has been working with with small businesses. Uh, most of it was in a more traditional way. Um, I was offering. Uh, SBA loans, Small Business Administration loans, so loans provided by a lender guaranteed by the government. And we were doing some very long-term loans to businesses that a lot of them were starting up franchises. Many were buying a building for their business. Sometimes they were buying a business 
uh, business acquisition financing. And we were doing that for businesses all over the country. Uh, and as you mentioned, I was working for uh, really the nation's largest SBA lender for much of my career. And I uh, had an opportunity to join a smaller lender that I thought I could help grow to become a, a bigger competitor of that, that, uh, that largest lender. And I did that just as the credit crisis was hitting. So it was not a great time to be with a small lender. It was a lender that needed to securitize its loans. So they would make a loan and then you sell a loan to be able to make another loan. And, and there wasn't mark- anybody to sell them to all of a sudden. Exactly. That market just disappeared there for a while. This was in, uh, in early to the late 2007, early 2008. And so the company I was with stopped doing SBA loans, uh, floundered a bit, tried to do Fannie Mae lending, lending to people who wanted to buy multifamily housing, and that was at a time just as Fannie Mae was starting to come apart. So things weren't going well in that area. But fortunately for me, that company that I joined had an affiliate, and that affiliate did factoring. Uh, It was not a type of financing I knew a whole lot about, but it was at a time when traditional financing sources were drying up, and factoring uh, is an alternative financing source. So, so let's so I, clarify, because I'm sure you just threw a word out there that some people may not be familiar with at all, and others may have heard you know, questionable things about. So recognizing that business owners aren't familiar with that product or account receivable factoring, let's explain to them in the simplest terms what factoring is and how it works. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, in its simplest terms, what factoring is, uh, is very different from a loan, and that it's not a loan. Uh, it's the sale of assets to another company, uh, to a factoring company, and the asset that a business is selling uh, is the accounts receivable that they have on their books. So our typical client is a business that sells, to, sells something, whether it be a product or a service, but they're selling it to other businesses. And when they make that sale, they're not collecting cash, but they're issuing an invoice and expecting to get paid down the road. Now, when a business does that, they have an asset, an account receivable. Um, It might take them a while to get paid on that account receivable. Uh, And I keep reading articles over and over again how it's taking longer and longer for businesses to collect the receivables. Now, a business that can qualify for bank financing, um, that's not a big deal, the fact that they're Customers are taking a long time to pay. They can just dip in and borrow from their bank when they need to. But if you're a business that doesn't qualify for bank financing, and that's a growing number of small businesses, what a factoring company like like Verson can do is buy your receivables from you. And the way it typically works is the same day you issue that invoice to your client, you send a copy to us. We verify it. Uh, by contacting your customer, uh, making sure it's a valid receivable, and then we advance to the business 75% of the invoice amount up front. So now they've got cash on hand to pay employees, buy inventory, keep the, you know, pay the rent, keep the lights on, do what they need to do to run their business. And then we collect from their customer. And when their customer pays, well, now we give our client the balance, that remaining 25% we did not advance up front, taking out our fee. And the way our fee accrues is based on how long an invoice is outstanding. And typically, two and a half to three percent per month. Okay, so Wait. so let's stop there because I knew I knew sure. we were going to get to that point. And uh, financing two and a half to three percent per month to the average person listening to this is going to say, "My God, that that sounds awfully expensive compared to what I might be able to get from my bank." So. I guess it's a two-part question. How do you justify that cost to your customers, and and uh, how does it work? Because I know they don't pay it pay it for you know forever. That your goal, I think I've heard you say that your goal is to get them into good shape so that they can resume their relationship with a regular bank. But but let's answer the question about the insurance or excuse me, the insurance, the interest first. How do you justify that high cost? Sure, sure. And uh, if you compare it to bank financing, it, it is going to sound very expensive. Uh, you know, interest rates are at all-time low and have been there for years and probably will be there for years to come. But our clients don't qualify for what banks have to offer. So to compare our rates to bank rates really isn't really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Our clients, typically what they have to compare us to are the alternatives available to them. So their typical alternatives are to forego doing business, uh, not be able to take on the business they need and grow, um, and not earn the profits from that additional business, or often their other option is to find a partner, 
uh, a VC or equity partner who's going to step in and provide some cash, but also now take a chunk of the business, take a chunk of the profit away from our client. Uh, and when our financing makes sense, it's for businesses that can do incremental volume, incremental sales, and have good profit margins. So just, just using a quick example, our average client has probably about 35% profit margin. So now they sell a widget, and they've got a 30%, 35% profit on the sale of that widget. Well, now, by using our financing, their margin might now be 30% if their invoice is paying in about two months with a 5% fee to us. Well, now they're making 30% on their sales. But if they can do more sales now than they could do before using our financing, it makes a lot of sense to use us. But you're right, it only sounds expensive when you compare us to what banks have to offer. But if our client could qualify for what banks have to offer, they would never use us. But the way they do use us is as a bridge. And we're very much unlike a bank in that we're not expecting to have long-term relationships with our clients. You know, we're typically signing... 18, 24-month programs with our clients. And and sure, sometimes they do renew, but ultimately they're using us as a means to an end, and that end is typically to get into uh, back into a bank facility or into a bank facility for the first time. But we do expect to be a temporary cost that they incur. And uh, and uh, that makes total, total sense to me. I, I'm sort of putting it back into my experience when I was in the residential market. And if someone wanted to move into their new house and, you know, couldn't afford, um, you know, all of the out-of-pocket costs because most of their equity was sitting in their existing house that didn't close yet, in those days we called it a bridge loan. And I realize it's not exactly the same, but it oh, is. it does sort of work that way. It's it, You are really that bridge to help somebody get from point A to point B so that there's not an interruption of business or an interruption of cash flow, which I, I think your your analogy of you know thirty five to thirty percent is is pretty generous when you look at it that way, especially if it's only only short term. So that makes total right. sense to me. So I don't want to start on another subject because we are going to be going to break here in about a minute. Uh, but uh, I, I I think start maybe answering quickly so people can think about it. Is, is he talking to me? Maybe give uh, just in t- fifteen seconds. What are some of the ideal like types of businesses? or categories of businesses where this would work for you and for Versant? We do a lot of work with with businesses that have strong customers. So often they're manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers. We see a lot of staffing companies, software firms, consultants, anybody who's selling either a product or service to to real strong entities. On the flip side... Perfect. Let me hold you on that one. Hit the pause button, and we'll continue that when we come back from break. We're going to go to our break. This is Carol McManus, America's LinkedIn lady. Stay with us. From Hawaii to the East Coast, she knows how to get the most out of social media. It's the LinkedIn Lady, Carol McManus, and this is the LinkedIn Lady Show. We'll be back with more right after these. Thinking of buying a home? Then join us for the REO Home Show, brought to you by BLB Resources, HUD Asset Manager for eight Western states in Michigan, with your host, Ray Warda. Tuesdays at noon central on the Rockstar Radio Network. REO Home Show will have exciting information regarding the real estate industry, focusing on HUD homes and the great values they offer. HUD Homes offers great benefits to buyers, including owner-occupancy exclusivity bidding periods, amongst many other things we'll discuss. REO Home Show will have some great guests on the panel that will provide excellent information regarding the whole HUD home selling process, as well as marketing HUD homes, plus information on some great FHA lending programs available to buyers. Realizing your piece of the American dream is closer than you think. Equal housing opportunity. For more on BLB and the show, check out blbresources.com. Then join us for the REO Home Show, brought to you by BLB Resources, with your host, Ray Warda. Tuesdays at noon Central Time on the Rockstar Radio Network. Are you the kind of parent who just wants their kids to live the life of their dreams? Well, grab your kids and join How to Raise a Millionaire Radio with Ann Morgan James and Jack James. It's a lively interview and call-in show, Thursday, 6 p.m. Central on the Rockstar Radio Network. This dynamic mother and son team are on a mission. They want to empower kids to dream big and go after those dreams with gusto. They want to fill the world with kid entrepreneurs. Are your kids ready for success? Don't miss their fun annex, lively guests, and discussions. For more on Ann and Jack and their show, check out their website, howtoraiseamillionaire.com. 
Then join the conversation of lively interviews and call-ins. And let's give our kids the tools and encouragements they need to build a future they can bank on, no matter what the economy throws their way. It's How to Raise a Millionaire Radio with Ann Morgan James and Jack James. Thursdays, 6 p.m. Central on the Rockstar Radio Network. Welcome back to the LinkedIn Ladies Show. Here is where you find out what social media can do for you and your business. Now, as trends change and new applications become available, the LinkedIn Lady Show will bring that information to you in an easy-to-understand, fun, and engaging way. Join us now as the LinkedIn Lady continues to show us the way. Now, let's get back to your host, Carol McManus. Hey, everyone. It's Carol McManus, America's LinkedIn Lady. You are listening to the LinkedIn Lady Show, and we are here with my guest today, Chris Lanis from Verse and Funding, and we're talking about factoring, which is a form of lending for businesses who have a uh, receivables that they need to finance in order to have something happen. And Chris is going to give you some more uh, examples, I know, of how that factoring money can be used. But most importantly, it's for the person who can't get the the money that they need for cash flow from traditional banking sources. So Chris, right before break, I had asked you, you know, what types of business are the best candidates for factoring? And I want you to go back and refresh that because I sort of rushed you right before the break. So you want to go back and finish that thought? Sure, sure. In, in terms of uh, the industries that we tend to do a lot of work with, it's industries that, that share some common traits, and those traits are typically that they have strong customers, so they're doing something, selling a product or service to, to big companies. They've got good profit margins, uh, like I referred to earlier, that they've got mm-hmm. the margins to be able to afford to, to factor the receivables, um, and they have trouble getting bank financing, but they can be a manufacturer, distributor, a wholesaler, staffing company, uh, consultant, uh, software firm can really run the gamut. And s- sort of on the flip side, the types of businesses we, we really can help are retailers. People who are selling a product or service to consumers are sort of the industry that just don't work with factoring because they just don't have receivables. Right. What they have might be credit card receipts, but it's not. Right. It, it, there are. There's a different type of lending for for like restaurants and and retail stores that have have credit card receivables. But uh, but this is very different. And and actually, as I'm thinking through what you're saying, it really makes so so much sense to me, because one of the complaints that I hear from a lot of people in my networking groups who are in small businesses, uh, and they could have the the strongest contracts in the world. It could be a government contract or it could be a contract, you know, with a with a major you know Fortune 100 company. Company. But the problem is government and companies are paying very slow these days. You know, they're trying to keep their cash flow alive. And what they might have at one point in time paid in 30 or 45 days, I've heard horror stories of, of three to six months, you know, to actually collect, you know, on receivables because they just put the brakes on things. So um, I can see where this can be, become really, really valuable for, for a business who has legitimate, you know, needs. But and, and like you said, a good um business that they're that they're in bed with if you will on the other end so a uh, curiosity question you mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that part of your process is to be in direct contact with your clients customers and i'm guessing that that might make some business owners pretty nervous so my question to you is how do you interact with their customers and how do you put your clients mind at ease so that you don't ep- jeopardize their relationships you're, you're so right. That is just such a common objection. And I can tell you, just probably every client we talk to, they worry about, well, what are you going to say to my customers? What are they going to think? And it's, it's wise to, to worry what your, your customers are going to think of you and what's happening with your business. But I can tell you, it's, it's never the issue that our clients expect it to be. It's just not the problem that they expect it to be. Well, for one, if factoring has been much more common, has become much more common than it was in the past. It's really not the, the kind of red flag that it, that it once was. Like somebody um, was in financial trouble is what right, I, I assume right. you're implying. Yeah, Absolutely. A, a business right now um, that doesn't qualify for bank financing is not alone. There's many, many businesses that don't qualify for bank financing, and a business might be in just fine financial shape and still not be able to get what banks are, are selling. So the fact that they're going to tell their customers that, well, okay, I don't qualify for what banks have, but I'm, I have financing, I, I have liquidity, I have cash on hand, is not really perceived as, as a negative in most cases. And I can also tell you that our clients often worry that, well, I've got a big customer. You know, I sell to Walmart. I sell to Target. I can't let them know I'm factoring. Well, 
companies like Walmart and Target and then all the big guys, they are paying factors left and right. I was going to say, they're the biggest leveragers in the world from what I understand. <laughs> oh, you can, you can, yeah, you can guarantee that, that the big guys are already paying many of their uh, factors instead of suppliers in many, many instances. And the big guys, they're flipping a switch in a payable system uh, and payments go to a new, a new address. And our clients' contacts at the company might even be aware that there's ever been a change. So it's just not the issue they expect it to be. And our clients also worry, like, well, what, do you, what are you, how is Versant going to interact with them? What are you going to say? Uh, well, we're not a collection agency. Our clients aren't selling us distressed receivables that we're going to now pound their customers for payment. That's not, that's not how we work. Uh, we are going to collaborate with our clients. We work with our clients on collection. And I can tell you a typical scenario is one of our clients' customers usually pays in 35 days. Well, it's day 45. We're going to call our client and say, well, what's happening? Maybe the answer is, oh, we're, we're working through an issue. There was a dispute, and we're working to resolve it, and they should be paying you shortly. Or maybe the answer is, you know what, I'm never selling to that customer again. You collect, you collect hard, and you make sure you get paid. Or a client might tell us, you know what, this is a dispute that's going to take a long time to resolve. Let me buy that receivable back from you, and I'll handle it. But the point of that is we're going to collaborate on collections. So our clients don't have to worry that we're going to start pounding them and hitting them up for, for payments or treating them negatively. And, I, and it's in our mutual best interest to perform that way. And that, you know, the way we make money adversant is by buying receivables and collecting them. So we want our clients to sell over and over again to these customers. So we're not going to do anything to jeopardize that relationship. So it's, it's just not the issue that our clients expect it to be. We're going to treat our clients very well. And I can also tell you that the typical experience is the receivables perform better with Versant than they do with our clients. Our clients are distracted. In many cases, they don't have a dedicated receivable person. Uh, it's often, in many cases, the owner who's also managing this process. But that's all we do is receivables. So we're very much on top of them. We're able to make sure that if one of their customers is taking a credit they're not entitled to, we're policing that. So you can guarantee the receivables are going to perform better with us. So all their concerns around what are you going to do to my customers, what's going to happen, uh, are usually just not the issue they expect them to be. That, that's And that's got to be music to a lot of people's ears. And you said something that just really hit me for the first time, because I've heard you explain this before. But it's the whole idea that the person who owns the business not only usually doesn't have the time or the support, you know, the, the system in place to be a receivable, they also don't want to be that receivable person, that, you know, with their customer, because they're more concerned about putting it at risk. So having a third party um, where it's it's strictly business, you know, and uh, it makes, makes total sense to me. I think that's very cool. So no, let's now go myself. back. Go, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to add one thing that, uh, again, just to, to speak to the collaborative nature of our collection, is sometimes our clients use us as the fall guy. You know, well, you know, blame the factor because they don't want to collect themselves. So blame person, though. Yeah, we're pressuring you for payment. So it's, sometimes it helps <laughs> to have a, uh, you know, someone to call the, the, the bad guy uh, when they really do need to get paid on a receivable. So it can go both ways. So now exactly. let's flip it around. Uh, you've got the relationship. You, the client qualifies. So the next question that I'm thinking a business owner would have, well, are you going to control how I spend that money? Or for what purposes can a, can a company use factoring proceeds? There's tremendous flexibility on that point. Um, as I mentioned, I come from the, the SBA lending world, and it, it was the complete opposite where how money got get spent was so strictly regimented. You had to document every dollar and have invoices and receipts to, to, to confirm everything. At Versant, we're, we're buying an invoice, and we, we pay for it, and basically in, in two installments, and how our clients use the money is completely up to them. Uh, I can tell you some common ways our clients use that money is to they may have a project they're trying to finance, and they just don't have enough cash in hand to do it. Uh, as we referred to earlier, sometimes it's a bridge. It's a short-term bridge they need, to, they need to, to get over. There may be an opportunity to purchase a big chunk of inventory at a discount, but very commonly it's just to meet the day-to-day -day work and capital needs of the business. And it, our typical client is using the factoring facility the same way they would a bank line of credit, using more when they need more and less when they need less. And that's actually just one of the great features of factoring, different from a bank line of credit, is that we don't set caps. 
with a bank, you'll have a line of credit at X, X dollar amount. Uh, with factoring, as long as you keep selling to strong companies, you can factor as much as you need. So if you've got a big burst of business with a client, well, you can get extra cash uh, because you go, you can factor more of those receivables. But we do not control how the clients use it. It's completely up to them. And that that's pretty cool because uh, as the, as the business owner, it's like okay, look, I've got good margins. I'm a healthy company. It's it's strictly an issue of cash flow based on again receivables with current clients. But there's things that I want to do that will help the business grow. Like you said, it could be just for day to day operations. Could be se- I'm sure seasonality may have something to do with sure. it too. Um, but also it could be for expansion or meeting new needs. Um, I, and we can start on this topic. I know. Uh, uh, we're sort of coming up on the half hour, but we have a few minutes here. Um, I, I, I believe I've heard you say that uh, sometimes a company can grow too fast. So it's not always that I need it to, you know, to cover expenses, but they have an opportunity to actually grow the business and um, and use it for, for those kinds of purposes. But the bank won't look at it because they're saying, hey, you know, we're not sure about you because you're, you're just growing too fast. And I, I'm, again, t- setting you up for a question that we only have two minutes, but go ahead and start answering that, and then we can always finish it up after the uh, after the half hour break. Okay, and you're, you're absolutely correct. As we do have some clients where they, there's no problem with the business; your business is going well, um, but that they they're growing more quickly than the bank is comfortable. And we'll often get a call from a client where, oh, I've got a bank loan; I have a two hundred thousand dollars line of credit, but. I've got a chance to sell $3 million worth of stuff to this great new customer, and that $200,000 in credit isn't going to cut it anymore. Uh, And so that's a a great opening for us where we're not concerned about dollar size for a strong customer. So we'll factor as much as they can generate in receivables. So it's it's not uncommon that the, the only issue our client has is not poor credit, it's not weak business, it's it's strong business, but more rapid growth than the bank is comfortable with. And that, again, is very cool because it, it, in these turbulent times, it's not like the whole economy has stopped dead in its tracks. There's some very, very positive things happening out there. So when somebody does land a big contract or, or perhaps takes a big contract away from somebody who has gone out of business, uh, this could be a perfect opportunity you know, for factoring to come in. I'm, I'm just loving this. It makes a whole lot of sense to me. And I hope you business owners out there are listening to this um, because this could be a solution for you. And I think... Uh, people are so frustrated today, Chris, with what the banks are, are telling them and that they feel like they're just stuck and that they may have to either declare bankruptcy or, you know, just shut the doors or, you know, these horrible, horrible solutions. And again, depending on the business, obviously, and whether they uh, they meet your qualifications, which we'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back, you are a solution for them. So we're getting ready to go to break. This is Carol McManus, America's LinkedIn lady, but we are not done yet. We're going to continue with Chris Linus of Verse and Funding and talk about how he uses social media. So stay with us. From Hawaii to the East Coast, she knows how to get the most out of social media. It's the LinkedIn Lady, Carol McManus. And this is the LinkedIn Lady Show. We'll be back with more right after these. Get ready for resources, tools, and support to help you build a successful business and live an awesome life. It's the Women's Business Success Show with your host, founder of the Association of Women Entrepreneurs, Tara McHugh. Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central here on the Rockstar Radio Network. Each show will feature a special guest interview. Tara will bring you highly successful entrepreneurs sharing their stories of success. You'll hear about the challenges they faced along their journey together with the advice they have to help you achieve more. You'll also hear from various personal and business development experts sharing tips, solutions, and strategies that you can easily implement into your business and life for amazing results. For more on Tara and her show, check out her website, aofwe.com. Then join us for the Women's Business Success Show with your host, the founder of the Association of Women Entrepreneurs, Tara McHugh, Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central here on the Rockstar Radio Network. Are you fascinated by the stories behind the stories, the people behind their masks, the truth about people's failures and redemptions in both their business and personal lives? Then Off the Record Secrets of with host Judy Schreiner is for you. It's people's secrets that make them interesting, but very few folks are willing to reveal them unless they trust that their information will be treated with accuracy, fairness, and respect. 
People have been entrusting their secrets to longtime business journalist Judy Schreiner for the last 25 years. And now she's bringing her expertise and impressive contact list to Rockstar Radio Network. Tune in and call in as host Judy Schreiner talks to guests off the record as they reveal new secrets each Tuesday at noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central. Welcome back to the LinkedIn Lady Show. Here is where you find out what social media can do for you and your business. Now, as trends change and new applications become available, the LinkedIn Lady Show will bring that information to you in an easy-to-understand, fun, and engaging way. Join us now as the LinkedIn Lady continues to show us the way. Now, let's get back to your host, Carol McManus. Hey everyone, it's Carol McManus, and this is the LinkedIn Lady Show. So happy to have you with us. I hope you're learning lots about uh, there's lending opportunities out there for businesses, strong businesses with strong clients, and you don't have to be paralyzed because of what's going on in the banking industry. So uh, the person with me today, again, I'll introduce him, and I want to definitely give you contact information. I always try to do that at the halfway point, and I will do it again at the end of the hour if you haven't grabbed a pencil or a pen yet. But it is Chris Lanus of Versa funding and you can just go straight to chris's website which is chris c-h-r-i-s dot lanus l-e-h-n-e-s dot com so very very easy to get him contact information is there and he would be happy to hear from you so in anticipation of those calls chris that are going to come in what information should a business owner expect to provide to apply to be approved for a factoring facility well, Carol, I can tell you it's, it's very simple. As I mentioned, I come from the world of traditional small business lending, and we were accustomed to there being many, many inches of paper to get a decision. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't common to have a foot of paperwork to get a decision. Tax returns, financial statements, uh, credit reports, sometimes business plans, none of that is necessary for factoring. It's a very simple application process. Because the only thing we're concerned about are the accounts receivable, that's really all we need to know a whole lot about. So what I'm going to ask my clients for is a receivable aging, uh, a customer list so I know who their customers are and can research who they are, and then I've got a couple questions for them. I need to know if there's a lien on their receivables. Um, it's not uncommon um, when they get financing from a bank that the bank will put a blanket lien on all their assets, which will include the receivables. So we just need to make sure that we can have a first lien because since that's the only asset we're going to have uh, a real concern about, we need to make sure we have a first lien on it. Then I'm going to ask about their margins. As I referred to earlier, if the margins are good, there's a better chance that factoring will work well for them. So I want to get a feel for if the margins are, are adequate. Okay, uh, then, so what you're, what you're implying by that is if the margins are really slim, this may not be the best solution. Absolutely. And, and uh, not too long ago, I got a call from a business owner. He had a um, sort of a fuel supply business, and he had a lot of receivables from a lot of real strong cost, uh, companies, but his margins were 10, 12 percent. Um, so to give away, in many cases, half of that, uh, it was just didn't make a whole lot of sense. So a business like that wasn't a good fit for what we do. So that's why we asked that question early is to figure out, is factoring really even an option for you? Mm-hmm. Okay. So how long does the process take? Well, the decision making is also quick because, well, because we're not underwriting our client's business either. I'm not looking at their, I'm not doing cash flow analysis. I'm not researching their industry. I'm just looking up the this credit worthiness of their customers. Well, as a result, I can usually uh, get a proposal in my client's hands within 24 hours, uh, and then if there are no surprises and things go as as planned, um, which really means. What the client tells us is accurate, and sometimes it's not always accurate, uh, but if it is, we can be funding them in, in three to five days. Uh, if there is a, a bank in place that has a lien, it might delay uh, as we negotiate with the bank to get that first lien, but it's still, we're talking days to funding, not weeks and months like they might experience. I was going to say, with SBA, it's months. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that so, was yeah, in the good old is... days when things were supposedly working. Um, yes, this is, oh, much, this is a whole different scale. A whole different scale. So I'm guessing there's people listening to this who are saying, okay, get, put this in perspective for me. So to help them, Chris, can we give them some specific examples of businesses you've worked with and how factoring was able to help them? Sure, sure. I think that's a, a great way to really illustrate um, what the types of businesses we can help. Uh, we're working with one right now. Uh, they're a consumer electronics manufacturer. Uh, been in business for a lot of years, and they manufacture um, some um, of the cheaper models of uh, tablets, uh, e-readers, MP3 players, and they're 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 selling those into so a lot of real great 
businesses are selling them to Walmart and Target and Kohl's, uh, among many other real big retailers. Now, the, the way this business got into trouble and needed to find an alternative was they shipped a bunch of product uh, to one of their customers that turned out to be defective. Uh, so they had huge returns coming back. Now, they did all the right things. They handled it well. They, they took them back willingly. Uh, they were able to refurbish them and resell them. Uh, but that led to a couple issues for them. One is it's expensive to do those things, uh, to take them back and refurbish, et cetera, and get them back on the market. So they incurred some, some pretty steep losses uh, over the last couple of quarters. Uh, and they had a lot of covenants with their bank. Uh, they had a a, a real, ba- real large bank facility, but there were covenants in that facility regarding profitability and regarding return rates, and they violated those covenants. So the bank said, oh, you got to go. So they've been paying down their bank facility uh, over the last uh, I think couple of months now, and now they're starting to run short on cash. And so this is another example of where we're going to bridge them. Um, that big return issue, really believed to be a one-time event. Um, so we're going to bridge them until banks are comfortable with them again so they can they can move on but it was a great example of a business that is strong has lots of strengths to it but has encountered a short-term issue that requires a bridge uh and so we're that's another also an example of a deal we're going to get done very quickly uh we were introduced to them last week and we're on track to, to fund them before the end of this week so we should be wow. very quickly get them that cash they need uh and their business is booming uh you may know that the consumer electronics expo was just uh last week mm-hmm. uh, in las vegas before. right mm-hmm. yeah uh and they they had a great reception to some of their their products so uh, uh they're in for a, a big 2012 but they just need a little bit of cash on hand to really take advantage of all those great uh, great orders they're getting that's wonderful is there a different example different industry different need or different use of the factoring money yeah i've got a couple others that i think are, are a good illustration uh another recent deal we closed was for a commercial printer you know sort of an Sort of an old line industry, uh, but still very active. Uh, they're very well established. What makes them unique and, and uh, benefiting from our program was that it was recently acquired. The our client recently bought the business, and the business had some some issues, and they weren't able to get a loan from a bank to buy the business. So they financed the purchase using seller financing. Basically, the seller held a note uh, for the sale price. And uh, probably some your your uh, listeners may understand that that can be that can be tricky sometimes if the seller is still connected to the business. Well, they've had a difficult relationship with the seller. Seller getting involved with some of their suppliers. Seller trying to get involved with some of their customers, uh, putting a lot of pressure on them for to increase payments to pay down her note. And so our client wanted out. They wanted to get out from that 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 seller note. Still not eligible for bank financing. Now they're still they still got some rebuilding to do. Uh, they were able to get a big chunk of it paid down by leveraging their equipment. Did a sale lease back on the equipment, gave the seller some cash that way. Uh, but now they don't have any liquidity. They need some cash on hand, and we're going to provide that. So we're again going to be a bridge. Uh, have a two-year deal with them. Two years from now, we expect them to be strong enough that they don't need us anymore. Um, but we were able to help them get out from under that seller note, so they can focus on the business do away with those distractions, and, and hopefully become successful. I love it. I love it. Those are both great examples. So the, the magic question, I think, is how does – I mean, there's other competitors, obviously, in this space, but how does Versant Funding differentiate itself from the other factoring companies out there? There's a, there's a few ways that, that we're different, and there, there are tons of factoring companies out there. Uh, we, we are small, um, but that, that's, we're small in a good way, you know, in that we're more of a, a boutique uh, type of lending source or financing source. Um, but we're well capitalized. Uh, there's a lot of real small factoring companies out there that are on a shoestring. You know, they're uh, maybe using a, a, some, some of the owner's money. Maybe they've got uh, a small line of credit, but they're only able to do some very small deals. Uh, there's something have, very ironic about that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, something really ironic about that. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I understand. I understand. Um, but we we have some deeper pockets. So we're small, but have the ability to do some, some pretty large deals. And we sort of tended toward a, a niche of client that has a big financing need, but there's some issue that makes them not only not suitable for bank financing, but other factors have turned them down as well. Uh, and because we're small, it's a very quick line to a decision maker. You know, usually when I'm introduced to a client, I'm very quickly putting them in direct contact with the owner of the company and we're figuring out is this a fit or not so very quick 
very quick decision. And sometimes a very quick no can go a long way to a, a business getting the financing they need elsewhere, if not with us. Uh, but you know, we, in addition to us being able to do big deals and decide them quickly, we give our clients lots of data, lots of information. You know, we talked a little bit before about how some of our businesses don't spend a lot of time keeping track of their receivables or monitoring them. We're going to give them robust reporting. So it's something else they're going to benefit from by using us is access to data on who's paying and when and how much is outstanding and really get a real good feel for what the receivables are doing at any point in time. They'll probably know more about their customers after this process than they did before they brought you in. Very true. Very often oh, that's, that's the case. That, that's fascinating. So um, I want to, I, there's another sort of a tip question I want to ask you, but mm. you just sort of opened the door to me uh, uh, because of a story that you told me about we're not the right fit for everybody. And I know not too long ago, you shared a great LinkedIn story with me uh, with someone in your space who you connected with on LinkedIn, and it ended up being a referral relationship. So sort of using that as an entree, let's go right into the social media piece about sure. how you use it and how it has benefited your business business? It's, it's been a real, a real great tool for me, and I really do focus on, on LinkedIn for the most part. And uh, the way I've used it over the last couple of years is uh, you know, as a way to grow my referral base. Uh, you know, I've had some people be dismissive of LinkedIn, that, oh, there's no deals on there. Well, no, I agree. You know, I don't think I'm going to log on to LinkedIn and, and someone's going to send me a deal that I, I connect with that day. Um, but what it's done is grown my referral base. And uh, what I do is uh, I belong to a number of groups. I'm at the 50 group limit. And they're all groups of professionals, I believe, can prefer me business. I'm not focused on trying to meet business owners online. I'm focusing on trying to meet their, their trusted advisors. So I'm, I'm in groups that will connect me with CPAs and business brokers and private, e private equity firms and other lenders and other factors, uh, which are often the best referral sources for me because these are people that are talking to businesses about their financing needs. And this, the story you referred to is I met somebody on LinkedIn uh, pr probably over, over a year ago now uh, in, a, in a factoring group, and he is a direct competitor. Uh, we're both factoring companies. And uh, like many direct competitors, there's overlap, but there's also areas where we, we complement each other. And uh, we connected, and he became part of my, my database, who he now gets postcards from me and emails from me. Uh, and he contacted him, and I've referred him actually a bunch of small deals, deals just too small for, for Versant. And he called me with a whopper. Uh, it was a deal that had some unique features that didn't make it a good fit for what his company does, but was a great fit for us. Uh, and it, it turned into the, the biggest deal in our history uh, that's been throwing off just tremendous revenue for us over the past past year now. And I, the reason the deal came to me is, well, for one, I met the guy for the first time on LinkedIn. And while he never openly acknowledged this, he called me moments after I, I, I posted something uh, on LinkedIn. And I suspect he was reminded that I exist, which uh, is a, a, a big part of LinkedIn is my staying in front of people and reminding them that I'm here and what I do. And what a great place to pause and go to break. When we come back, we're going to talk more about that because you really have mastered that as a skill, and I really, really honor you for that. So let's take a break. This is America's LinkedIn lady, Carol McManus, and we will be back with you in just a minute. From Hawaii to the East Coast, she knows how to get the most out of social media. It's the LinkedIn Lady, Carol McManus. And this is the LinkedIn Lady Show. We'll be back with more right after these. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for you to be a rock star. Get ready to rock with Rock Talk and Kirk Deswalt. And learn how to achieve rock star status in your industry. Every Tuesday afternoon at 2, 1 Central on Toginet.com. Craig Deswald is the creator of the Rockstar System for Success. Craig will share easy tips and strategies on how entrepreneurs and businesses can use outside-the-box marketing strategies to stand out from the competition. Each high-energy show will feature interviews with celebrity rock stars as well as business rock stars. For more on Craig, the show, and the Rockstar Marketing Boot Camps, check out the website, Craig Deswalt, D-U-S-W-A-L-T dot com. So you can learn how to be perceived as an expert and celebrity in your field, so more people come to you to buy your services and products. Then, get ready to be a rock star with Rock Talk and Craig Deswalt. Tuesday afternoons at 2, 1 Central on Druggynet.com. Booyah! That's the word uttered when you know you have the upper hand. Or you're the winner. 
Well, now we have the Booyah Radio Hour with Martin Brassi. Tuesdays at 9, 8 central on toginet.com. Martin's show is all about helping speakers and authors find their niche, create their brand, and achieve massive success. Each week, Martin will interview guests from around the world who have achieved tremendous success as speakers and authors. You'll find out who they are, what they do, and how you can follow in their footsteps to achieve incredible results. Guests will come from around the world of business, entertainment, finance, the arts, and sciences. Nothing is off topic. No subject too taboo. We'll share valuable information as well as huge laughs as we discover the ups and downs of being a successful speaker and author. The Booyah Radio Hour with Martin Pressy. Tuesdays at 9, 8 central on togedad.com. Welcome back to the LinkedIn Lady Show. Here is where you find out what social media can do for you and your business. Now, as trends change and new applications become available, the LinkedIn Lady Show will bring that information to you in an easy-to-understand, fun, and engaging way. Join us now as the LinkedIn Lady continues to show us the way. Now, let's get back to your host, Carol McManus. Hey, everyone, it's Carol McManus, America's LinkedIn lady, and you are listening to the LinkedIn Lady Show. So happy to have you with us. We're here today with my guest, Chris Lanis, and we are talking about money and lending and factoring for the business who has a viable business and great clients and great receivables and can't get the money from the bank. But just before break, we were talking about social media. And Chris, I have to honor you in a very, very big (laughs) way. You so get it. And the thing that really struck me about what you you said was that you are not even trying to do, you know, a go after the direct client or the business owner, that, that it's very strategic in your approach in the sense that you're trying to build those referral relationships through either other uh, factoring people in your space or trusted advisors of the business owners. And I just think that is totally brilliant. And it totally supports my idea or what I have been saying for several years now is the business is not done on LinkedIn. It's you get yourself noticed on LinkedIn you and then you take the conversation offline. So uh, maybe you want to go back and fill in a little bit more about your journey on how you got there and maybe you have another success story you can share. Sure, and I'd be happy to do that. And you know, I, I love to take credit for, for what I'm doing, but is uh, I, I, I came up with the strategy after being in one of your seminars. Uh, and one of the things you, you said that that's struck me was with relatively little effort, you can become very visible on LinkedIn because most people are just there watching. Uh, and so I found that that is, that is very true. And by doing things like, and I, I, I said before I, I posted, what I'm posting is I'm usually posting articles, uh, links to articles that I think people in my industry would, would find interesting. So um, articles about small business lending, about, uh, about uh, what's going on with banks, or just information I think that my client, my referral sources will find useful. And I, I post them in the groups that I, that I described, and often people will comment on them. And uh, when they do, I see who they are, and if I think they're a good match for me, I will request a connection. And people, for the most part, will, will accept those connections. And, and uh, once connected on LinkedIn, I try to take the connection into the, into the real world. And maybe it's just an email, um, but maybe it's a phone call, and if they're within a, a radius I can get to in a car, we'll, we'll get face-to-face. And, and so a lot of those connections start on LinkedIn, but then you know, become real-world connections. Uh, in addition to the deal I described that I met somebody on LinkedIn, a, a deal came this week, and it was somebody I, I met a year ago on LinkedIn, and uh, he contacted me for the first time with a deal this this week, but he's been getting my messages throughout, not only on LinkedIn, but also as part of my email campaign, also part of my direct mail campaign. So it's just a really, it's a, a strategy of visibility. And, 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 and I, I just really- I, I love that, and I and it you know you can call it the drip campaign, but it is sure. a form of drip campaign. But the other thing that I love about what you said, and listeners, I hope you're really paying attention to this. When you send people to articles, don't make it self-serving. They aren't always going to be your articles. They're going to be somebody else's article. Chris is an avid reader. He's an avid researcher. He's very he gets a lot of good information about what's going on in his space, and I've clicked on a lot of those links, and they're fascinating. But it isn't you know it, it should not always be back to your website 
or your blog. It can be, but it shouldn't always be. And I think that's something, again, that, that you've totally mastered in the sense of you are now the go-to guy for really cool information. And hearing that last story about somebody who came back to you, you know, a year later, uh, it like all prospecting, it takes uh, time. Some, some may come quickly, but there's no guarantees of that. But it is building those relationships and that trust. And, uh, and I also, you know, totally agree that, you know, the, the quality and the more they get to know you and like you online, the more it's likely going to result in, in uh, taking it offline and building a, a true trusted relationship so that they'll do business with you. So do you use anything besides LinkedIn? Because that's always the next question. I've I've started to do a little bit more with uh, with Twitter, and uh, you know what I'm usually doing is the the same thing. I'm I'm posting on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm blasting out on on Twitter, uh, and I've been you know trying to play around with using hashtags to try to get greater visibility there. And, and my Twitter followers are increasing as a result, but I, you know, I'm still at, at a few hundred. Uh, I also. You know, I've heard you say this as well, which is what piqued my interest is I see a lot of potential in YouTube, and I've just started to play around there um, by doing things like, like posting PowerPoints. I'm actually having a, a webinar tomorrow that I'm going to record uh, and then post that on, uh, on YouTube. I can see that as a, as, a, as a good tool I could then blast out on, on Twitter and, and LinkedIn as well. Uh, but those are, those are, that's really it. And I can tell you it's, it's probably 85% LinkedIn and just a, a smidgen of, of the other two to this point. But that's important. That, that's really important, again, for people to understand because, again, you've been in, in, in groups with me where you can tell people's eyes glaze over and they just get so paralyzed <laughs> because they say there's so much I can't do it all, so they end up doing nothing. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to be on every site. And, Chris, you're in space where, where Facebook is not the right place to be. Facebook's right. wonderful, serves a great purpose, but if you're in the business-to-business space, as you described, and if you're trying to get in front of trusted advisors, they may be on Facebook, you know, hanging out with fraternity brothers or former neighbors or sharing, you know, watching what their kids are doing. But when it comes to business, they're looking for a more serious relationship. And uh, I think that's the, you know, that's the game. So let's switch back to your business because I, I, I want to bring it back full circle. Uh, what you have pretty much said is any company in the factoring business obviously has to have significant expertise when it comes to account receivable management. But what tips can you provide listeners on how to best handle their accounts receivables? Sure. I think I think first and foremost, it starts with, with maybe some caution. Um, a lot of the business owners that I meet and talk to, they're, they're They've got great passion for what they do, and often they're, they're salespeople at heart. And so they have a, a product or service that they believe in, and, and when they find somebody who wants to buy it, they, they want to sell it. Uh, they want to sell the people who want to buy. Well, if you're selling to businesses that can't necessarily pay you for what they bought, it's probably not the best sale. And we've seen a number of clients get into trouble because they made that sale they shouldn't have made, and they didn't get paid. Uh, um, so first... Ask some questions. Know your customer. Um, be careful. Uh, re- do some research. Uh, there, there's a lot of credit information out there on businesses. Look into it before you agree to sell to somebody uh, on terms. Um, you know, maybe you're going to require a little more of a down payment from a customer, or, or maybe you're going to uh, increase your sales to them over time. But be careful to start with. Make sure you know who you're selling to. And sometimes the answer needs to be no. Uh, when somebody wants to buy tons of your stuff on terms, and um, we, we hear more and more of clients being asked to take on 60 or longer terms, that's a long time to wait to get paid. So sometimes the correct answer to a sale is no. And it's just important to have information. And I mentioned earlier that we're going to provide them a lot of data on the receivables. But in, even if they're not using Factor, uh, just making sure you've got a receivable management system in place. You know, I once got a receivable aging from a, a customer that was handwritten on, on you know, lined paper. Uh, it's, you know, it's a moving target, the receivables. And so you need to have a system that, that can accommodate that and know what's out there, know what's, what's outstanding. And all the more reason to assign somebody to be responsible for receivable management. And maybe that's not your sales guy. Maybe that's not the owner of the company, but somebody who can really stay on top of them. Someone who contacts customers regularly, you know, particularly in a time when, when cash is tight. Um, you know, often it's a, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. It's, it's a cliche, but it's true. And, and if you're not calling your customers to get paid when they're late, well, they're, you're not going to get paid. So it's important that you, you stay on top of them. And concentrations can be, can be dangerous. And by concentration, I mean just having too much of your business with any one customer. It, it tips the balance of power 
too strongly to to your customer, where now they start to, to dictate terms to you because they know they're such a big chunk of your business. And I've seen businesses fail as a result. You know, particularly businesses that that had one of the real big guys as a customer, and the big guys they 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 call the shots. They start squeezing on margin. They want the prices to come down. They start pushing out the terms. So be careful about concentrations because they can get you into trouble. Wow, I, I, I'm just I, I'm sitting here taking notes on what you're talking about. <laughs> so let me parrot back to you what I heard in in my layman's terms, so that you can correct me because I want that, that is so important. Everything you just said, I want to make sure the listeners um, are are picking up this. The first one I, that I heard was research who you're getting in bed with, and I think in stressful times uh, there is that that sort of tendency to want to jump into the sack with oh, yeah. whoever the next contract is because you think, oh my God, you know my my client my competitor blew it, but I'm going to land XYZ company, and this is going to be the greatest thing. And they don't realize that the reason maybe the competitor lost the account was because they didn't get paid, and they said, look, we're not interested in doing business with you anymore. Right. You don't know the other side of the story. Um, and now, you said you can research them. I can see where it would be pretty easy to research public companies, but with private companies, would it be appropriate to ask for a, a, you know some client recommendations? No, that's, uh, that's a great point. Sometimes have a credit application. You know, give your client a, a basically an application to, in order to get credit from you. Uh, it's not at all uncommon. Again, clients are often afraid to ask for this, but it, it should, should be seen as your right to, to know who you're, you're extending credit to before you do it. Uh, and that's that's a really good idea. So we're, we've got three minutes, so I want to make sure I hit the other three because I want to make sure I got them right. Second one is have a system. And again, that may be, you know, on a smaller scale, it's a, probably, I'm guessing, an Excel spreadsheet, but it could also be, you know, some type of a software system. But your point is it shouldn't be on a cocktail napkin. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> okay. It's too important you, for that. You say, hey, I think Joe still owes us some money, okay? Um, the squeaky wheel on collections, uh, I mean, I think we can all learn from that. And again, you never want want to, uh, you know, jeopardize a relationship, but you also need to treat all relationships as business. So picking up the phone and calling and say, hey, you know, I'm concerned. You've always been such a great client. Uh, I noticed that, you know, uh, the bill was due last week and it's, you know, it's 10 days later and, and I suspect it's in the mail, but I just wanted to check. So there's nice exactly. ways to do that, right? Sure. And then the last one was the concentration, and, and that also makes – I know a company, actually, uh, uh, wasn't a client of mine, but it was a client of someone in my coaching chapter who was coaching a business owner who had all of his eggs in one basket. And uh, and it, it, it he ended up paying a very, very heavy price for that. And, and the reason the coach got involved is they were helping them sort of rebuild and reinvent themselves. So huge piece of advice. You know, leverage yourself as much as possible, which I'm guessing is probably harder in some businesses – and um, but but you need to do that. So wow, yeah, Chris, I cannot thank you enough. You have covered so so much, and of oh, course, right. I, I hope everybody listened to the social media piece because yeah. this is the man to follow. And his point about being visible and being out there consistently really does pay big dividends. And you've heard me say it before, and you'll say it. You'll hear me say it again. I'm a broken record. Um, but Chris, we have one minute. Any last minute thoughts for our for our listeners before we sign off for today? Well, just coincidentally, I mentioned I am having a webinar tomorrow. So if anybody really wants to get into some nitty gritty on this, uh, you know, head to my website, uh, chrislanis.com, uh, and um, you can get, spend an hour getting into some of the real nitty gritty about uh, about how factoring works. Ah, what a great, great suggestion! So c h r i s dot l e h n e s. No dot. Chris, dot com. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carol McManus, America's LinkedIn lady, signing off. Please visit me at linkedinlady.com, and I will catch you on the next show. Thanks for listening. Thank you for being a part of the LinkedIn Lady Show on Toginet.com with Carol McManus. The LinkedIn Lady Show is here to show you and your business how every social media site has a specific